Welcome to the B'nai B'rith International Podcast. I'm CEO Dan Mariashin. Thank you for tuning in today. I'm joined today by Cheryl Kempler, our archivist here at B'nai B'rith International. In this episode, we'll be talking about B'nai B'rith's relationship with the Jews of Romania in their own country and later on in our own. Cheryl, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you for having me, Dan. Now, some say that Romania was the first European country to establish B'nai B'rith lodges. Uh, now, what was the situation at the time, and why, why do we think that that was the case? Uh, and how did the U.S. B'nai B'rith facilitate the introduction of our organization in Romania? Well, uh, one might say, why, why Romania? Why this little country, and why is it so important to B'nai B'rith? Well, it really impacted our history several times. And the first time was in the early 1870s. This was a time uh, the country had just been formed, and there were a lot of anti-Semitic laws being enacted. There were riots. Uh, The Jews were being repressed, uh, not allowed to work in various positions, particularly professional positions. And it wasn't just the United States that had their eyes on this country in terms of their treatment of the Jews. Uh, Diplomats in France and in England had a presence there, and there were also diplomats in Germany and Holland that were trying to put pressure on the Romanians to stop what they were doing. And, of course, in the United States, Jews were very anxious and were uh, trying to trying to see how they could help the situation. And although we had a consul in Romania, what the Jews here wanted, many of them, was to send a Jewish man to Romania. And we had an officer here at B'nai B'rith, a young man who had been president, or what that call, was called the Tsar in those days, uh, Benjamin Franklin Peixoto. He had been the Tsar of the organization in his 20s. And in the 1870s, he was only in his mid-30s. He had just become a lawyer, and he's living in San Francisco, and he met with a lot of people who were trying to get us to be have a presence over there. And he asked his friend Simon Wolf to intercede with President Grant and have him appointed consul. And Simon Wolf was not, um, uh, he was not exactly confident of Peixoto's diplomatic talents. He was an American, he was brash, he had a style all of his own, but he did that. And Peixoto was sent over, uh, President Grant complied, and Peixoto was sent over as the consul uh, with his six children and his wife, and he got there in 1871. And he was credentialed in the summer of 1871 when he became the second, America's second consul to Romania. And where was Peixoto from? Peixoto was originally from Cleveland, Ohio. And what's interesting about him is here he was a Sephardic Jew. The name seems to be of Portuguese origin. Uh, he the Peixoto Satius, they were a dynasty from the 18th century on. Big stuff, big family here. Uh, they, of course, the Truro Synagogue, they were part of that uh, line. Uh, so Peixoto uh, had just, just gotten his career. He started out as a newspaper man, and then he became a lawyer. And he was taken with this passion to go over there and do what he could because the reports that were coming out of Romania were quite, uh, quite ugly, a lot of... Now, in those days, uh, I, I, what would the population, Jewish population of Romania uh, had uh, have been? Uh, we know on the eve of the Holocaust, for example, there were more than 800,000 Jews living in, in Romania. So I would imagine even uh, so many years before, 70 years before, 65 years before, it, it must have been a substantial population. Well, there were not only Jews who were purely Romania, but in the 1860s they had a lot of immigration from Turkey, Germany, and the Habsburg Empire. But still, there were only about 300,000 Jews at that time. And by the turn of the century, that population had depleted by about 70,000 because they were all coming over here. Now, Peixoto doesn't have the diplomatic experience. I think in those days it was a little bit different in terms of assigning people to diplomatic posts. Um, today, he would have been the ambassador. He would have been named ambassador to Romania. But consul, I think, was the, uh, the title that was used, at least in, in those days, for, let's say, smaller uh, missions abroad. He was there for five years. 
Uh, what were his contributions to ameliorating the situation for the Jews at that time? Well, Peshoto, of course, was interfacing not only with the king, King Carol I, but with the population of Romania, the Jewish population that was the elite. Now, most Jews were very poor. They lived in rural areas, but there was a thin level of very, very, um, not just affluent, but incredibly educated and type A Jewish personalities. And so he was forced to, to sort of be good to them, to have them like him, and also to have the king like him as well. And, and the king the king was very, uh, was, did not like the Jews very much. And uh, interesting factoid, he was married to Empress Elizabeth, and she was a world-famous poetess. She wrote under the pseudonym uh, or moniker Carmen Silva, and all of her poetry had this kind of brotherhood content, you know, uh, fraternity, and, and that made it all the more ironic because uh, people were walking around Romania bashing Jews, and she was writing all this lovely... Silva itself was a, a Sephardic name. Uh, it, well, it's a, she took it from the Latin. Carmen, of course, is poem in Latin. And Silva means a, a lovely forest, a glade. So this is like poetess of the woods. You know? And she, again, she, everyone knew her name. And people here and all, all, the, all over the countries were asking, you know, why does she not do anything with her outlook? But I guess she had her hands tied to a certain extent. Uh, so Peixoto came over there, and he was interfacing with, uh, among other people, the future head of District 9, the Romanian district, Adolf Stern, who was an important personality in his own right. He was an attorney who made his name in Romania, not because he was an attorney, because he was not allowed to practice. That was one of the prohib prohibited professions for Romanian Jews, but because he was a translator of Romanian contemporary literature as well as a translator of Shakespeare. He translated Shakespearean plays into Romania. He was lauded for that. He was decorated for that, and he was the first Romanian Jew to receive citizenship in 1880. And he worked, Peixoto worked with Stern, who he made his secretary, and he they tried to be diplomatic to both segments of the population. When you talk about district Nine, District Nine of B'nai B'rith. So, what what comprised District Nine in those years? Well, District Nine was not formed until ten years, actually more than fifteen years later, when Peshoto was in Romania. He helped to start what was called the Zion Lodges, which had similarities with B'nai B'rith, but was were also related to the Masonic lodges as well. And these, uh, the men who formed these these lodges, the Zion lodges, were again the elite uh, Romanian Jews, and what they had to do, which what they were forced to do, was to create schools, because the Jewish people of, Jewish population of Romania, at certain points, were prohibited from sending their kids to the public schools. So they created a, a bunch of secular schools that also taught their religion. And they gave scholarships. This is what they did. And it was not until 1889, long after Peixoto had left, that these lodges were converted to B'nai B'rith lodges. And they were done so by the German district, District 8. Uh, they had a representative come to Romania, and he gave them like a little pitch about B'nai B'rith, and they all unanimously decided that they would convert the Zion lodges into B'nai B'rith lodges. So where was the first lodge in Europe? Was it in Germany or was it in Romania? The first B'nai B'rith lodge in Europe was in Berlin in 1882. The first B'nai B'rith related lodge was in Romania in 1872. The first B'nai B'rith Romanian lodge was established in 1889. And actually 10 of them were established at once. So... Peixoto left after his five years. Did he remain active with B'nai B'rith? Uh, he did. He became the publisher and editor of our first magazine, the Menorah. And he, he actually was later appointed consul of Lyon, France. That's what he did after he left Romania. And his tenure there had its ups and downs, let's, let's put it that way. But he remained, con he, first he thought that the Jews could be assimilated and then emancipated. But when he left, he realized that really the only logical thing for the Romanian Jews to do was to leave. 
and he told them that he they needed to protect themselves. He told them to carry firearms. Another thing that got him in trouble with the with the king as well as the elite Jews. I mean, they they had a very much more reticent touch. They were European. They they, um, but when he left, he this is what he went on to do. He became the publisher of our first magazine and editor as well. Who were the um, some of the men who became leaders in the Romanian lodges, and, and how did the lodges work to improve the condition of the Jews in Romania? Well, they took up the mission of the Zion Lodge. They continued to build schools, but they were they were very much interested, as B'nai B'rith was, in uh, making connections with the non-Jewish world. So they funded hospitals. They started, when there was a war, they started an ambulance corps for the Romanian army. They did whatever they could, despite the fact that they were constantly being rejected and brutalized. They continued, and this is what I think is the admirable part, in the face of all this, uh, they, they, they continued to uh, try to make efforts to deal with the Romanian government. They, they were engaged in philanthropic endeavors as well for the Jewish community while at the same time um, seeking to, to reach out to the, to the broader community. Precisely. And, and the, of course, the Jewish community of Romania, very much impoverished. They lived in rural areas. They established uh, kitchens for them. They had uh, societies for the poor that they supported. Uh, they started uh, farming schools. Uh, they started schools for on the primary and secondary school level because by 1893, most regions in Romania, Jews could not attend. That was the big deal. They pr- made a law that Jews could not attend. They had, still had to pay the school taxes, but they could not send their children there. So that all happened not long before, or at the same time, actually, of uh, the great uh, immigration to the United States by the Jews from Eastern Europe. It was the arrival of Romanian Jews to the U.S. that, that signaled a great change for B'nai B'rith and its missions and projects. How did that come about? Well, by 1880, the great wave started. The Romanian Jews, by and large, would not come until 1900, when things got so onerous that they had to leave. But at first, the members of our of B'nai B'rith, or what we called the Order at that time, were quite reticent. They felt that the Jews who were coming over were uh, different. They wore different clothes. They were uneducated. They were poor. There were great numbers of them amassed in urban areas, and they were causing a lot of problems in terms of poverty and and uh, crime. And they were they tried to detach themselves from this new population of Jewish people here. But over time, they realized, with the aid of some excellent leaders we had, like Simon Wolf and Leo Levy, that they were really morally responsible for helping them and improving their condition. And they began to understand that this was, they were leaving the country, uh, Europe, uh, life and death situations. And they realized that it was their duty to help them improve themselves. And that was the difference between the first wave in 1843 and the second wave. The, the members of the order were by now were affluent and they could really use their position to help these new people. When they came here, did they organize, the, the lodges that were organized by them, um, were they all Romanian lodges or, or were, were they mixed? Because you had immigrants coming from so many different places. Well, when Leo Levy, who was from Galveston, Texas, he, when he became president of the organization in the late 19th century, he decided that his where he needed to be was New York City because that's where the uh, large amount of Romanian Jews were. He moved to New York, and he began to set up headquarters down on the Lower East Side, just where B'nai B'rith had started before. They moved there. They moved their, the Maimonides Library there. They had a place where social workers could interface with the Jewish immigrants. But not only did they do that, what they re- what B'nai B'rith wanted to do along with other societies was to bring Jews out into the hinterlands. They didn't want them to continue to amass in this little ghetto on the Lower East Side. They wanted to bring them to places where they could actually 
have a good quality of life. And they and other organizations formed what they called the Industrial Removal Organization. I know it sounds a little strange, but they it literally meant what they said. They wanted to get Jews away from uh, in-home sewing shops, the factories, and bring them out to places where they could be merchants, where they could work on farms, where they could become a, a st- own businesses. And they had a lot of, uh, they funded Jews to go out there. And of course, it was the lodges of the United States that became the network to bring Jews out and to get them jobs and, and new kinds of work. So as I said before, on the, on the eve of the Holocaust, there were 800, 850,000 Jews living in Romania. How many lodges were there at that point, let's say, when the war broke out in 1939? How many lodges were there in Romania itself? Well, one of the reasons that the Jewish population increased so much was after 1918, Romania tripled because they were on the side of the Allies. So they brought in all these new provinces from former Russia and from Poland. So you had three new provinces where the size of was really increased. And uh, the uh, by, by 1935, the lodges continually grew. By 1935, you had the highest amount of B'nai B'rith lodges in Romania. 22 lodges and over 2,000 members. And of course, they had a great leader, Rabbi Niemerauer, who was not only a rabbi, but head, the head of the Jewish organization in the Senate, because the Jews had finally been emancipated with the end of World War I. He was both an Orthodox rabbi and a Reform rabbi. He was a writer. He was, this guy had had the power to really attract new people to the lodges and to fight for them in in Parliament. And you can imagine what that was like with all the anti-Semitism and the politicians in Parliament. But he did have an ally in King Carol II who was not an anti-Semite. And he tried to help the Jews as much as he could. So yes, as as the 30s, that was certainly the case in most countries of Europe in the 30s, as as anti-Semitism grew, people returned to the lodges for solidarity. But it sounds as if after Germany, which had over 100 lodges at that time, it sounds as if then Romania would, would have been very high up on the list in terms of the number of different lodges um, in, in the country. Uh, as as compared to other countries in Europe. Does that sound right? I, I think uh, Romania was on a level with Bulgaria. I think they had as many lodges. Um, yes, I would say that after Germany that had the big amount of lodges, it would it would have been Romania and Bulgaria afterwards that had the most. Of course, the postscript is uh, of terrible devastation of the Jewish community during the war. And then in the communist era after the war, uh, B'nai B'rith was not allowed uh, to operate. In the, in the mid-90s, uh, we did reestablish a B'nai B'rith Lodge in Bucharest, and uh, that lodge still is, is very active and very involved, uh, not only in Romania, but also within the broader family of B'nai B'rith Europe. In addition to that, uh, B'nai B'rith participated in a very important um, project, which was um, uh, the Elie Wiesel Commission on the Holocaust in Romania, Wiesel was named chairman of uh, a group of scholars and Jewish organizational representatives, and I served on that commission, uh, to study the Holocaust in Romania. And as a result of that study, um, a, an institute for Holocaust research has been established in, in Bucharest. Uh, there is a Holocaust memorial um, in, uh, in the center of, of Bucharest. And um, the... Um, uh, plans are now underway for a museum of Jewish history uh, akin to the Polin Museum uh, that exists in, in Poland. Uh, but this is uh, a new project, uh, and they have a, a beautiful new building that they have selected for this. That in the Bucharest? Government, in Bucharest, mm-hmm. that the government has mm-hmm. uh, made available to the city and the country, mm-hmm. uh, made available to the Jewish community. So uh, the story continues for, for B'nai B'rith. Uh, of course, uh, tragically, so many hundreds of thousands of Jews lost their lives um, in, in the Holocaust, um, in, in Romania. Great Jewish history there, as you pointed out, our history. The cradle of Yiddish theater. Too. Cradle of Yiddish theater. I, I would just say one other thing. You're reminding me now. The founder of modern Yiddish theater, or the founder of Yiddish theater, was Avraham Goldfaden. Goldfaden began his theater in Yash, 
uh, in uh, the northern part of Romania. Uh, and there is a, um, the theater is no longer there, but the site is there, and there is a, um, a bust of, of Goldfaden. And when I visited a few years ago, um, it just said Goldfaden, but it didn't really explain who or what. And so uh, B'nai B'rith uh, had a plaque made, uh, which uh, mentions, talks about, uh, this was the first uh, site of Yiddish theater. Avram Goldfaden was the founder, and it uh, is in Romanian and in Yiddish. Uh, and in English. So those who are visiting Yash uh, will have an opportunity to, to see that as well. Well, Cheryl, as always, we thank you for your insights into uh, B'nai B'rith history, particularly today about the Romanian lodges. We look forward to another episode uh, of, of our history. We're uh, in our 175th year, so there's plenty of history to talk about, and we look forward to your coming back. Thank you for listening to our podcast. Please visit our website, benebrith.org, like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, subscribe on your smartphone through the podcast app for iPhone or through Google Play for Android. And lastly, tell a friend about us. For my guest, Cheryl Kempler, I'm Dan Mary Ashen. We'll talk to you next time on the Benebrith International Podcast.